fighter pilot. The words convey something of the spirit that lies in our squadrons. Something young and vigorous, decisive, wanting action at once and finding its expression in the struggle going on daily over our southeastern shores. In many newsreels, you have seen pictures of fighter aerodromes, thick with aircraft, towards which a swarm of mechanics and fighter pilots is making a determined rush. You have been shown, in other films, the organization which controls the movements of the fighters in the air. But you have not yet been let into the mind of the men who do the flying, nor shown their feelings when in the air and going into a fight. The long periods of waiting are a test of temperament. Some pilots occupy themselves actively, others pass the time in sleep. Nor have you been shown the difficulties and discomforts from which the pilot suffers when he is seated in his aircraft. Let us look at the inside of a pilot's cockpit with its massive instruments and then think of the hours of practice needed before the pilot can understand all their uses and employ them satisfactorily. See the pilot in his kit. It is bad enough to be in a flying overall. It cramps one's movements quite a lot. But look at this, the life belt used when flying over the sea. It is called a May West, rather unkindly. Now the parachute. It is impossible to look pompous in a parachute. And now, having got our pilot into his seat, complete with cap, goggles, and the rest of the outfit, we have got to lash him in there so that he will not fall out. Wouldn't you hate to be in a straight waistcoat of this kind, with only a small part of your face showing? The radio telephone and oxygen mask are combined in one. This has to be firmly clamped across the pilot's face so that only the sound of his speech shall get into the microphone and also to prevent the oxygen leaking out and wasting itself. Now the takeoff. Throttle right forward. Stick central. Ease her off the ground. Back with the throttle to normal boost. And now up with the wheels. The leader looks round to see if the rest of his section are with him. One is lagging a bit and is told briskly on the radio telephone to close up. And then they climb up to patrol height. Above the clouds it gets colder. The pilot cuts off the air from his radiator to keep up the temperature and wriggles himself more comfortably into his seat. 5,000 feet. Watch the needle of the height indicator. Up they go. 10,000. Still higher. 15,000. 20,000. The rear aircraft of the formation weave about so as to keep an eye on possible enemy attacks from the back. While the leader searches the sky in front for the enemy. It is bitterly cold and the curious depression and feeling of isolation that comes when flying at great height would insensibly affect the pilot's fighting qualities if he were not helped by his oxygen supply. Suddenly the leader, who has been keeping up a two-way conversation with the ground control which is directing him onto the enemy, sights something. Carry ho There they are, Jerry's. He fires. There's a stream of lead from the guns and he's got him. That's one down. Our guns again. Number two. Jerry's bailed out. But the 
fight's still on. That's that. And so, back to the aerodrome, stiff and cold, but very pleased with life. The pilot is brought back to realities by depressed-looking airman pointing to a large hole in the wing, the inference being that he is a bad pilot to allow himself to be shot up. When you read in your morning paper that our fighters have brought down 10 or 20 enemy aircraft, please visualize what you have seen today. Wish them luck, happy landings, and a good rest after labor. <laughs>